So we're all basically tubes. You know, food goes in one end, comes out the other. The digestive tract is a tube with a lot of wrinkles in it, you know, a lot of bends, a couple swellings. We've got other tubes as well. For example, our nervous system. That's basically a tube as well. Sure, the brain's kind of swollen and wrinkly, but when you think about it, it's basically a tube. And that's, in fact, how it starts. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. That's the first part. We'll cover neurulation, how we create that early tube called the neural tube. Because certainly we all start off as just a single cell. Well, this eventually expands into a, a ball of cells that kind of folds over on itself forming three principal germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Then we take those sheets of cells and create some tubes. The endoderm will create the tube that we call our digestive tract. The ectoderm is actually going to create the tube of our nervous system, as well as the skin. And between them, uh, certainly worth mentioning, the mesoderm, which creates the musculoskeletal system. So it might be important to you all. After we cover neurulation, and basic development of the spinal cord, we'll talk about spina bifida. There are other types of neural tube defects, just the outcomes are nowhere near as good, so we're going to talk about spina bifida. And in this slide here we can see an example of a more severe type of spina bifida called myelocele, so open neural tube defect. But let's talk about neurulation first. That's the process where our nervous system separates from the rest of the body. Now, while this movie plays over here, I'm going to kind of draw out what's going on for you in cross-section. So, this is looking at the disk of cells that we kind of start off as. we got our three germ layers. Ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. All right, of course, these kind of continue around. We have, a, we have a disk here. But three basic layers. Ectoderm on the outside, mesoderm in the middle, endoderm. Uh, buried. Well, what's going to happen here, we're going to fold these sheets and eventually end up with something that looks kind of like this. Ectoderm, endoderm, we're going to have our neural tube, a notochord, some somites. That's the end product. So what we just saw happen there is the the cells growing to the midline, folding over, and eventually fusing to bury a tube under the skin. Now we're going to see it here. That's the neural tube, which contains the brain and the spinal cord. So all of the central nervous system. All right, let's see this in cross section. So the ectoderm. This makes not only our skin, but the nervous system. How does it know what part to make the nervous system? Well, the mesoderm has this structure called the notochord. And that tells the overlying tissue you're going to be future neurons. So the midline structure forms the nervous system, the rest forms the skin. The notochord is also attached. So when we have that inward migration of cells, instead of sliding around, the ectoderm bunches up. Here's my notochord, still right there. Here's my neural folds. This is the neural groove here. So this is still ectoderm. right? This is pushing inward. And so for the, the nervous part, I'll just thicken it up a little bit. So that'll be all of this stuff. Just right there in the midline. Now what we need to do is a little cut and paste. We're going to sever the connection between the future nervous system and the skin. We're going to fuse the nervous system to itself and the skin to itself. And so what this will look like, if everything goes well, we're going to have a continuous sheet of skin buried underneath it. We'll have our neural tube, the notochord. That's going to stick around for a while. It'll eventually form the centrum or the vertebral body. And then we'll have some somites over here. The somites create the musculoskeletal structures at each spinal level. Now this isn't perfect. Like when you slice some bread, you leave some crumbs. Same thing here. Instead of crumbs, we've got neural crest. So the neural tube forms the central nervous system. The neural 
suppressed forms the peripheral nervous system. The notochord here. Uh, this is still playing a role. We'll talk more about that next semester. But that's basic primary neurulation. We're not done though. All right. We haven't built the entire spinal cord yet. All we've done in primary neurulation is build ourselves a uh, brain and most of the spinal cord up to around OS2 or self. The rest we're going to build through secondary neurulation. So primary over here, secondary for the very end. So there's a couple of sacral and then a coccygeal segment we got to add on. Instead of folding a sheet into a tube, we're going to start with a solid rod and turn that into a tube through cavitation. That's what's going on there. So that very end, that's the medullary cord, that gets turned into a tube and then we just fuse these bad boys together and wouldn't you know it, we got ourselves a nervous system. Now, this process of primary neurulation starts uh, around the kind of neck, shoulder region, and then extends in both directions. Okay, so here it is in uh, a slightly better, I'd say, than my cartoon, but they don't give the neural crest, so eh, there's still some value over here. So we can see the cartoon format here, check out the slide. Um, that is going to continue in both directions, toward the head, toward the tail. So we have two different places where things could go wrong. Now, there could be multiple sites where neurulation begins. Fair enough, they're showing us that on top. It depends on the species. Um, but what we care about here is the failure of, of neurulation. Okay, so there's primary neurulation. Secondary neurulation is shown here. So we start off with a solid core. That's what's shown on the bottom. Not a sheet that we fold over, and we're just going to hollow it out. Nothing too tricky there. Now the problems that can occur with secondary neurulation is that we fail to separate that medullary cord from the overlying tissue, so it might get stuck to it. And this can create something called tethered cord syndrome. So if our, if our um, most uh, distal portions, or caudal portions of the, the spinal cord, if they get kind of fused to overlying structures, so when we're putting our medullary cord together, if we don't cleanly separate it from the skin, this is going to give us problems later on. The last thing we need to do uh, to finish off our development here before we get into uh, spina bifida is build ourselves some vertebrae. So this is not the end. We still need to encase our spinal cord here in bony structures. We do something similar in the heads. We're going to have a few pieces of bone that fuse together. We're going to fuse some bone together in the spinal cord as well. So what has to happen is, well, let me just give us a new one, new spinal cord up here. Okay, we got skin, we got a, a neural tube in here, and then we have these bony structures. We got the centrum. This used to be, oh boy, um, this used to be the notochord. Yeah, good enough. We got our neural arches. These neural arches, slide says it a whole lot better. These are going to grow and meet and fuse to form a single bony structure. They'll also fuse with the centrum. And then we have ourselves a vertebrae. How nice. So we need to fuse some bones together. That's the last element. This invariably goes wrong in spina bifida might not be a bad thing in all cases. You don't always get symptoms if it's just this. But one of the problems that can arise is when we fail to cover up our nervous tissue, well, on occasion it can herniate outward. That's when we run into problems. All right, let's jump into spina bifida. So spina bifida, we're affecting the spinal cord. Now there are neural tube defects that do affect the head. Those tend not to go well though. So the worst of all neural tube defects are the open neural tube defects. 
failures with primary neuralation. We keep the sheet a sheet, and that's a problem. Neurons don't like air. In fact, neurons don't like a lot of things. But exposure to air will undoubtedly kill them. So, when we're zippering up, if we fail to zipper up in this direction, we have ourselves a, a failure with cranial neuralation. The brain will exit out of the skull, that's the eggs encephaly, and then it will degenerate, giving us no brain and encephaly. If we have failure going the other direction, down the back, that's where we get spina bifida. That's where we get a failure with spinal nergulation. In this case, it's called myelocele. This is the worst kind of spina bifida because our nervous tissue is open and exposed. We've had a major problem with development. On occasion, both things can happen together, both the top and the bottom of this slide over here. When those happen together, it's called craniorachiskesis. Don't make me say that again. The outcomes here, well, it depends. Cranial issues almost invariably lead to death before or shortly after birth. These are not uh, survivable in most cases, and that's why we're not going to talk about them. You probably won't see anyone with a cranial neural tube defect. They are rare. Spinal cord defects, more survivable, but Certainly they come with their own set of problems, paralysis, sensory loss, um, at and below the level of the lesion. Now if it's an open neural tube defect like this, the other problem that can occur is risk of infection, right, because we're exposing neurons to air. So we got to fix this. This is a, an emergency. It must be fixed if we're going to survive it. we got to repair the open neural tube defect. Now remember, spinal cord. Right, this is a relay between the brain and the body. So why do we get at and below the level of lesion? Well, let's say we have defect here. Okay, uh, so we killed off the neurons, uh, the, the the motor and sensory. We've we've destroyed the the axons that are running through there. Okay, not a good thing. So if we're innervating something above it, well, we're fine. No damage has occurred. If we're innervating something at the level, well, clearly we've killed off that motor neuron, it doesn't exist anymore. Oh no. Uh, if we're innervating something below, oh, we damage that axon. If we're below the lesion, this neuron, although it's alive, it's not getting any more input. So, when we think about uh, like how we affect muscle activity, above the level, everything's fine. At the level of lesion, well, we destroyed the neurons, so we're actually going to have flaccid paralysis because we killed the lower motor neuron. There's no way we can communicate with the muscle anymore. If we have damage above, well, here we can have something called spastic paralysis. So the lower motor neuron is still alive. It just doesn't have an upper motor neuron to lift it. I'm sorry, to listen to. So what does it listen to? Whoever else will talk to it. Oh, like, you know, a sensory neuron. So it's still going to stay alive, it'll still get neurotrophic support from the muscle because it's innervated it. It's just we don't control it. Now what you tend to see is an increase in muscle tone because it's almost always getting input from the sensory neurons because they're alive too. And we almost always feel things. So those sensory neurons create a whole lot of activity in the lower motor neuron which increases muscle tone. So we think of tone over here. And it's about the same, so it's normal up here. Decrease muscle tone, increase muscle tone. Depending on where we're talking about. At the level of lesion, certainly a flaccid paralysis. Below, it could be spastic paralysis. And then, of course, the sensory signs will occur. Now, although the sensory neuron feeds onto this lower motor neuron, you know what it doesn't do? Make it up to communicate to the brain. So we'll lose feeling below the level of the lesion, and of course, add it too. Now, spina bifida has four types, going from least to most severe. We have spina bifida occulta. Good thing is, it's the most common, uh, but most people don't catch it. It's usually caught by accident because of some sort of um, imaging of the spine or something like that, or something unrelated. The only issue here uh, is a hairy patch of skin on the back. But there's no weakness, no sensory loss, because in this case, although we haven't created our, our vertebral arch properly, 
we haven't had any extrusion of nervous tissue, so everything's fine. Well, I don't need to draw it, it's right there, upper left. The next two are what we call herniation neural tube defects. So here, neurulation went just fine. We fold it over. We got a tube surrounded by skin. Cool. But now the either the meninges by themselves or the meninges and the spinal cord herniate out. So they can actually form an exposed cyst. Meningocele, just the meninges. Obviously not good, but not as bad as myelomeningocele, meninges and nervous tissue uh, are herniated out. And the worst of them all, myelocele, that's the bottom right. That's where we have a failure with primary neurulation. We remain a sheet. That's not good. So these are very serious. Alrighty, so um, as far as birth defects go, neural tube defects are fairly common. You get about 20 to 200 per 100,000. Uh, of course, there are different risk factors that can change the likelihood of a neural tube defect. Family history is an obvious one. So, of course, the process of neurulation and spine development, those are encoded genetically. Of course, environmental factors play a role, but your genetics do as well. And if there's a genetic problem that affects neurulation, that gets handed down. So a family history increases risk. Um, the use of teratogens. And teratogens are just uh, drugs that cause birth defects. Now, of course, no one prescribes this. Here you go, take this teratogen. Instead, they'll give a drug used for one purpose, but unfortunately, it interferes with normal development. Uh, an example here would be anticonvulsants, like uh, valproate or something like that. These anticonvulsants, um, while they do decrease the activity of neurons, that's kind of the whole use of them, they also interfere with neurulation. So taken during the first trimester, the risk of neural tube defects increases about tenfold. There are other things uh, related, such as maternal diabetes or obesity. We can see that in, in this table here, right? The odds ratio is 1.79. You look at the 95% confidence interval, it doesn't have one. So maternal obesity increases the risk of neural tube defects, uh, as does diabetes. Another thing I want to highlight here, uh, the low dietary uh, folic acid or folate intake. There's a relationship between folic acid and neural tube defects, where low levels of folic acid intake increases the risk and folic acid supplementation decreases the risk of neural tube defects. That's why when you or your significant other uh, get pregnant later in life, you're going to take prenatal vitamins and they're going to have folic acid in them uh, for sure. All right, the symptoms that we see in spina bifida. Well, this is basically a spinal cord injury. So we, not surprisingly, get a mix of uh, uh, sensory and motor deficits arising. So we're going to see paralysis, like I said, flaccid, certainly at the level. Uh, and we could see some spastic uh, paralysis as well uh, below. Sensory loss, of course that's going to happen. Now, bladder and bowel incontinence. This is almost always an issue with spinal cord injuries because of where those neurons live. They live, for better or worse, down at the bottom. Down in the sacral spinal cord, that's where those neurons live. I feel like that's not the right one. Uh, yeah, I guess it is. Anyway, the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons live down the sacral spinal cord. So they are going to innervate, in this case, the bladder. And they'll cause the bladder to constrict and us to then urinate. These are not regulated by upper motor neurons in the cortex. Instead, they're regulated more by neurons in the brainstem. Of course, to get from the brainstem down to the spinal cord, you got to go through it. So if we have damage, that's going to de-innervate our autonomic neurons. So we'll see bladder and bowel incontinence. If we're above the level, just like we see that increase in muscle tone for skeletal muscles, same thing over here. Increase in tone, we'll have a spastic bladder. On the other hand, if you were to have a lower lesion, so if the spina bifida affected the sacral spinal cord and these neurons are lost, well, 
Of course, we can't provide that input. Rather than an increase in tone, we're going to see a decrease in tone. Either way, we're not going to have good regulation of urination or bowel function. Those neurons live in the same area. They just send their axons to a slightly different location. <clears throat> now, because of the, the weakness, um, sometimes not occurring uh, symmetrically, either on sides of the body or on sides of a joint, you can see musculoskeletal deformities in spina bifida because of that imbalance in strength. Of course, the um, motor weakness and the lack of sensation can predispose uh, us to the development of ulcers because we're putting pressure on one spot, we're not moving around a whole lot, and we can't feel it. Uh, we can't feel the irritation uh, building up. So, again, just like what you'd see in spinal cord injury, because spina bifida is spinal cord injury. Another issue here that you won't see in spinal cord injury, at least traumatic spinal cord injury, is hydrocephalus, the buildup of water within the brain. That's all that means, hydrocephalus. Compare the top to the bottom. What's going on in the bottom there, you'll see the ventricular system swell up. So, big old bloated ventricles. Why? Well, if we have something like a failure with secondary neurulation or maybe some scar tissue from surgery, which we'll get in a little bit, this can create a problem where the spinal cord gets trapped in place. And as, the, as we develop, our spinal cord doesn't grow any longer, but the spine continues to grow after the nervous system is developed. And that's why we have that lumbar cistern down here, where we can take spinal taps, we have the cauda equina down there. But they start off even. So if this gets trapped, instead of having that space, the spinal cord gets stretched. It can pull down brainstem tissues. That creates what we call Chiari malformations. So, we got our brain, brain stem, and this exits the skull through a hole called the foramen magnum. And then we got the rest of the skull. I never really draw the skull, so forgive me, but that's the skull. Now, if we, are, if we start pulling tissue downward, well, notice this is a lot wider than here, so we're trying to stuff tissue down in this hole when we have these herniations. Right? So if you pull the cerebellum down or the medulla down, this is going to squeeze the tissue there, and my, my um, ventricular system is going to get compressed. There's my lateral ventricle feeding down to a third ventricle, coming down to a fourth ventricle, and then down in here. If I compress that, I'm going to block the ventricular system, all of the cerebral spinal fluid that I continue to make here has nowhere to go. So what's it do? Well, it just balloons up like a water balloon. And that's the hydrocephalus, water in the brain, in the head. This, uh, this herniation of the brainstem can also create little fluid-filled cysts uh, within the brainstem. It's a condition called syringomyelia. Those fluid-filled cysts can put pressure on tracts that pass through, like the corticospinal tract can get compressed. That'll create spasticity. You're damaging upper motor neurons, so you get hyperactive lower motor neurons. We can also damage brainstem structures, experience some vertigo, maybe a little ataxia, right, if we're compressing that, that cerebellum or something like that. Of course, if we compress the medulla, vital function can be impaired, like respiration. So what do we do about spina bifida? Well, hopefully we prevent it. Hopefully we take our, our vitamins, have good luck. Uh, of course, by vitamins, I mean folic acid in this case. But once it occurs, how we treat it, well, it depends on what symptoms we're talking about. If we're talking about incontinence, well, we can treat that depending on what type of incontinence it is. For example, if we have an overactive bladder, which is more likely, then we use anticholinergics. Because remember, the parasympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine, so if we antagonize acetylcholine receptors, that hyperactive uh, cholinergic input can get turned down a bit and normal bladder function can resume. Of course, we can also use catheters, timed enemas. The hydrocephalus is treated uh, by putting in an 
intracerebroventricular shunt, an ICV shunt. So this is just going to pull fluid out of the ventricles. You can see the catheter on the on the baby's head there, and it's going to run a line down into the uh, intraperitoneal cavity, and so we're going to move that excess fluid out of the ventricles, hey, there they are, and into the gut, where it'll just be reabsorbed. All good. It doesn't build up in the head, so we don't build up pressure, start pushing on neurons. That's never a good thing. Of course, the real uh, kind of first uh, treatment that has to happen with spina bifida is surgery. So this can happen after birth uh, to, pair, to repair the neural tube defect or also to repair those musculoskeletal abnormalities that can occur. Even better though is to have prenatal surgery where surgeons go in in utero and repair the neural tube defect. So you can see a little schematic over there. So when the neural tu tube defect is detected they open up uh, while the baby's still inside the womb, repair, so close the neural tissue, close the dura, and hopefully prevent further damage. So when we're talking about uh, these negative outcomes, of course a 2 by 2 table comes to mind. So if we compare prenatal to postnatal surgery, prenatal is of course experimental, bad uh, outcomes always on the left, so in this case hindbrain herniation, the Chiari malformations, which are fairly common with neural tube defects, because we're not cleanly separating the nervous tissue from the other structures, so that can pull down on our hindbrain. Okay, how often do we see that? Well, you can look at our event rates. So in the control group, about 96% of them had a hindbrain herniation, but only 64% in the experimental group. So prenatal surgery had a lower event rate. If we look at the relative risk, 0.67, okay. So about a one-third reduction. So we only had about two-thirds of the risk of a hindbrain herniation. Look at the 95% confidence interval there. You'll see it doesn't include one. So therefore, it's a significant reduction in risk. What does this translate to in terms of number of people? Well, look at number needed to treat. It's only four. That means if we were to give four kids prenatal surgery instead of postnatal surgery, we would save one additional child from having a hindbrain herniation. That's pretty good. How about functional outcomes? Well, the ability to walk seems uh, to be much better with prenatal surgery. So the event rates, you can see down here, a little bit lower than our Chiari malformation. Relative risk, 0.73. Cool, okay, so we have lower risk with prenatal surgery. 95% confidence interval doesn't include one, so it's a significant reduction in risk. Number needed to treat, five. So for every five kids that get prenatal surgery instead of postnatal surgery, we will have one additional child who can walk independently. Of course, this isn't without risk. You get in there, perform surgery, you're going to create scar tissue, and we can have that tethered cord syndrome. All right, so this could be because of failures of secondary neurulation, so it could be a developmental problem, but it could also be something caused by the corrective surgery as well. Um, of course, abnormal growths could also tether the cord there. So there's a lot of ways that the cord, the spinal cord, can get stuck to the overlying tissues. And when it does, that's a problem. Because remember, that spine continues to grow, although the spinal cord doesn't. If it's tethered, it gets stretched. And that's not a good thing. So what we might see then later on in life is the development of progressive sensory motor signs. So we're going to see signs of spinal cord damage, and they're going to get worse over time. And that's because as we grow, we continue to stretch. That stretching creates damage. They can create fluid-filled cysts. They place pressure. That creates more damage. It's not a good thing. So we need to go in, have another round of surgery to remove the scar tissue, to separate the cord from whatever's tethering it. it could be scar tissue, abnormal growth, whatever it is. We need to go in, surgically separate the cord so we don't have any further stretching. And then, of course, occupational and physical therapy uh, are going to be in the future, even without tethered cord. Well, spina bifida needs it to, to improve range of motion, strength, and, and to know how to properly use the assistive devices. All right, I got a few questions that you can go through to kind of check your understanding.
If anything seems a little weird or you just want to review it, uh, fill out the questions box so I know what to chat about in class. See you later.